Okay, so let's get started. Thank you everybody for coming today for our conversation about inclusion in the development industry. Um, my name is Nigel, I'm an urban planner at Smart Density and we're here with Leslie Wu, who I'm really excited to see. Um, Leslie is a respected leader with over 25 years of experience building sustainable communities and shaping urban development in Toronto. She assumed her role, her current role of CEO at Civic Action in September, 2020. So civic Action is a premier civic engagement organization that convenes leaders from all sectors, backgrounds, and experiences to facilitate impactful solutions to pressing challenges in the GTA and Hamilton area. Before joining Civic Action, Leslie served as a Chief Planning and Development Officer at Metrolinx, where she, where she worked for over a decade. She has experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors as a planner, architect, and community activator. And to name just a couple of her accolades, Leslie has named BizNow's 2019 Toronto Power, Toronto Power Women in Commercial Real Estate and one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women in 2017 by WXN. Um, Leslie is also a founder of SheBuildCities.org, or the founder, I should say, where she uses her voice and platform to amplify and celebrate other women city builders. Um, I would love for this to be a bit of, or Leslie and I would love for this to be a bit of a conversation. So I strongly encourage everyone to like post any questions throughout and we'll try to get to them all through the presentation. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. Hi, Leslie. Um, Hello. <laughs> so I guess to jump, like, let's just get right into it. So we're here to talk about why we need more inclusive cities, who is included within those cities, and how do we make inclusive cities a reality? So you can get started. Thanks so much, Nigel. And maybe before I start, if I could just do a very brief land acknowledgement. And um, so many of you know me, or some of you know me, I'm Leslie Wu, as Nigel introduced me, CEO of Civic Action. But if you really knew me, you would know that I'm a descendant of the ancient peoples of both Northern and Southern China. My family origi originally migrated as indentured laborers, laborers, first to Martinique and then to Trinidad, Trinidad, the land of the creolized and assimilated Carib and Arawak peoples, an island that was settled and colonized by the French, the Spanish, and then the British, all of whom displanted and enslaved people of African descent. I'm an immigrant to Canada and now live here on these Treaty 13 lands, the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and Mississaugas of the Scugog Island First Nation. I believe in the spirit of the dish with one spoon and believe that we can share this land to the mutual benefit of all inhabitants. Today, the GTA is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island and we recognize the historical oppression and inequalities that they continue to face. Depending on each of our ancestry, we each have different relationships to the land on which we live. In our, in our role as civic convener at Civic Action and in the spirit of reconciliation, we are committed to rebuilding and renewing respectful relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous people. We support indigenous sovereignty and we support the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. So thanks and um, for all the folks who are wherever you are hailing from, um, thank you for being here and for the time. And thank you to, uh, to Nigel and to Nam. And I don't know if um, uh, uh, Nigel told folks, but Nam isn't here probably because uh, she just uh, ha had a new member join her family just as recent as yesterday. So we wish her all the best and congratulations. I'm going to start uh, and I will share my screen, if I can remember how to share my screen, um, to begin because I wanted to um, just give a little perspective on some of the things that, uh, here we go. So um, Nigel described my background and in many, Leslie, oops. So you want to switch back to the other view? We can just see your Sorry, name. got it. Here we are. Uh, wanted to really um, sort of set some context about why this is even an issue, why someone trained as an architect and a planner, um, look how the lens through which I look at this issue, um, which is really on many respects, not so much a social justice issue, uh, while that is one of the issues, but is also from an economic standpoint. So having worked for many years, both as an architect and an urban planner, and, and most of my career very much focused on the physical environment and how we can shape the physical environment to create as more complete communities, more livable spaces, I've seen how uh, power in all its shapes and forms, whether it's by title, by election, by influence or activation, activi activision, 
activism, sorry, at the grassroots, that it actually is a very powerful, it, it, it does enable us to make change happen. Um, and I've also seen that public, uh, how public policy and strategic planning can create great wealth and in some cases, I think what we're in today, what we're seeing is an aggregation of wealth. And I'll talk about that a little bit. I've also had the privilege of uh, living through and being an advocate for uh, more public investment in a range of public goods and in particular transit. And, you know, being part of this, of a multi um, billion dollar effort to transform the region through infrastructure investments has been a, a great pride to me uh, but at, now at this stage also a great form of reflection having now left metrolinks because i think what i uh, in reflection I, I look at is the benefits uh, could have been and can still be much more significant so there's opportunity lost uh, which i think we need to regain and the reason for me that inclusion matters is because in many respects, our, there is a bit of a broken so, social contract between civil society, government uh, in these pieces. Um, many of you may have seen this diagram um, and it reflects um, what's been happening in different industries um, that through the pandemic, a number of us have done really, really well in fact, we've excelled, and I would say that the land development industry and those in that space have succeeded. Many of you, if you're in this space, you've been you know, busy, lots of work, lots of investment. And then we know that other parts of our society, when we just look at the industries themselves, uh, have not really, they're, they're struggling. They were struggling before, but the pandemic has made the gap even wider. And we know that there are even greater long-term um, impacts, whether it's unemployment about people in low income, wealth inequality, the continuing worsening of the racial wealth gap and growing corporate monopolies. So the K-shaped recovery as it's referred to is also affecting the nature of work, our ability to innovate and adapt, adopt new technologies and um, the role, the fact that more people are being managed by automation and algorithms. And so while as, and the one thing we also know as we've seen in previous recessions, some of it will be permanent and uh, especially for people in low income quant quintiles. Right here in Canada, uh, we, these are two little factoids, you know, 47% of Canadians now say they are $200 or less away from insolvency. That's a high percentage. And it's particularly in fact affecting what we refer to as equity deserving communities. So women, uh, low income earners, um, folks, you know, whether by sexual orientation, by ability, by age, by education level, that gap has widened and is becoming more and more difficult to bridge. I started this um, uh, with a land acknowledgement and I kind of, this is a little diagram just to kind of talk about how we look at uh, the industry we're in, uh, the land development industry and how it sits. And, and when, we're, when we're addressing public policy issues or plans, the fact of the matter, so if you go from uh, your left to right, there is, when we think about land, and those of you who have been doing some study on our indigenous history, uh, land, uh, the worldview of the indigenous communities um, was basically suppressed, uh, you know, emptied, annihilated, and the notion of land ownership and land settlement uh, was uh, taken as a very different view. And then we moved into this kind of control of ownership, uh, lands that went into private ownership, lands that were retained for public ownership, and private lands uh, either continued on uh, to create intergenerational wealth that was handed down from generation to generation or um, private investment. And today, as we think, as we fast forward a little bit, uh, external investment, whether it's through immig immigration or foreign investment. Public lands, on the other hand, whether provincial, municipal or federal, have been in theory allocated towards more public goods, roads, transit, parks and recreation, schools, water systems, energy systems, healthcare, arts and culture. But private um, uh, land, privately owned, uh, comes into forms, whether it uh, has transformed itself into home ownership, turnkey assets, 
or uh, things that are landlord controlled, so rental in particular or REITs and so forth. Much of our time, if you're in the development planning industry, you're spending all your time in the far right. And so if you think about the Ames notion of um, power of 10, our perspective is very much uh, formed by our, the work we're doing, whether it's our relationship with municipal planners or the development industry. And the K graph that I showed before uh, really indicates there are a lot of folks who are getting missed out because the space that we're concentrating on is on the far, far right. And at this point in time, as we sit here in 2022, there's an urgency to our ability to begin to, not to begin, to bridge that gap and in that K because between the industries and the areas and the people who have who are gaining ground and those that are losing ground. Um, this little graph shows uh, economic recovery and the two-year cycle of opportunity that is generally created when there is um, uh, the ability to, uh, when governments in particular begin to invest or private sector begins to invest in recovery. And so there's a surge that happens two years following and we're in that period. So there's huge opportunity to direct uh, our investments in the next two years to benefit uh, many, many more. Uh, so really, when we talk about inclusive cities, Nigel, um, I really think about it in multiple dimensions, not only social inclusion, which is about participation and rights and access, but it's about economic inclusion, which has to do with, in, many, some, in some cases for the indigenous folks, economic reconciliation, as much as it has to do with the issue of intergenerational wealth and how that is handed down and the aggregation of wealth. And of course, the area that many of us in this profession are most familiar with, which is uh, around spatial inclusion and, and what that means. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and just kind of uh, really, um, in many respects, when I talk about the broken social contract, Nigel, it is the fact that the, um, the, the role of government, the role of the private sector, there is a inherent notion that there is a reciprocity between the two that is required for us to fulfill both the private sector needs and, and the public sector needs. And we have come to a place where that is that trust has been broken in some areas and it is going to be really critical for us um, on so many fronts to bridge that gap. That was a long answer to that question, but there we go. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I think, yeah, you did a really wonderful job of sort of just outlining the ways that, you know, like wealth and economic power can so often be leveraged into social power and like the ability to shape our cities and how if you're leaving out economic justice, or not economic justice, but economic inclusion, then you're also leaving out social inclusion. It's hard to have those things actually be separated. And I guess going from that, I'm wondering, because often I understand sort of these ideas as rely on the government and that our government's responsibility to enact policy that sort of does redistribute in this way. And so I'm curious to know how you can see the private sector as playing a role in that. That's a good question. I think there are many ways and there is at the scale of your organization and corporate uh, there's at the scale of your neighborhood, then there's what you can do individually. And, and when we think about the roles that we all want to play in this, um, oh, someone's asking you to turn up your volume, Nigel, even though I hear you very well. Um, uh, there are many roles we can play. In, and there's a lot of literature right now about uh, how all of us in our, in our professions and our personal lives can um, be allies, which um, uh, is about standing in solidarity, working, but it's, di we're, uh, you know, and having a voice or giving a voice on issues. But I think when we think about um, architects, planners, um, developers, uh, the, the space designers, I think there's a role for us more as what I would call an accomplice or co-conspirator and working to dismantle structures and systems, which is, diff which is different from what I, my definition of allyship. And so we think about ourselves as uh, uh, accomplices in the change that needs to happen. When we think about how we're designing, how we're planning, it's important for us to think about um, a more, I know uh, this is gonna sound um, basic, but that we're looking at human-centered solutions. And, and I don't just mean human-centered design, 
but that we're putting people at the front of our decision making and people broadly speaking and all people. So it, it's as simple as when we're consulting, uh, the, the more familiar thing for many um, is, is how we consult and who do we talk to and how do we get the insights from others. So that's, that's one area I think um, that both planners and, and designers and developers have, have advanced in knowing that they need to um, begin to hear the voices of others. But we need to almost, we, it, it needs to be taken to the next level. And what I mean by that is, um, it is also who's around the table when we're thinking about what we're specifying from a supply chain standpoint. You know, is our supply chain diverse? Is it giving access to as, as wide a range? When we specify, um, the, you know, do we make specifications around uh, who, you know, the diversity of opportunity we create through our procurement processes? Is it allowing for uh, small to medium sized business to participate or is it only scaled at, at the scale of large conglomerates um, and even for those large conglomerates if you work for one when you look around the table uh, how are you making sure that um, your your representative not sorry not just representative because that's just about diversity how is it that your practices are inclusive so your recruiting practices how is it that you're able to ensure that who's at the who is um who is working uh with you brings a much of expertise technical expertise as well as lived experience to the table because it it's going to sound a bit pollyanna at this point but i'll tell you the technical part and all the policy part and all those pieces we can solve for the thing that is more difficult is to really recognize and put uh, more at the center that that um, there are people that are um, not, is everyone benefiting from what I am doing? And, and, and or can more people benefit from what I'm doing? Um, and so that is the question we keep having to ask ourselves. So, um, so I think that's, that's kind of one of the pieces I would say about this top down, bottom up model. Is my leadership um, uh, really, um, do they put value into this? And from a grassroots standpoint, both at, am I listening at the lower levels of my organization? If I've got a large organization with a hierarchy, does everybody have a voice? Do uh, the, the rest of the community, is it, am I willing to take on challenging views to how I'm um, piece, piecing things together? And, and am I setting up, am I able to set up or do I have the right um, people around the table to set up a trusting environment from which we can begin to uh, to solution. Right, I think that's a really excellent point. I think recognizing or paying attention to who is at the table and who is contributing to those decisions is super important. It makes me, and you mentioned transit, and it makes me sort of think about how issues for sustainability are often viewed as being beneficial to everybody because we're talking about the planet, we're talking about our air quality, we're talking about all these things that are shared by everybody. But then when you look closer, you realize certain people are getting displaced and other people are not. But as like someone working in planning or architecture, if you're not from those groups, it would you can have a blind spot for that and not recognize that that is happening. So unless you're giving opportunity for people to speak about that, things that appear to be benefiting everybody might not necessarily. So I think that is an excellent point. Yeah, I, I just maybe to add one more, I think it's always, uh, always asking the question, can I do more? Mm. Because, you know, even if you're in um, in a space where you're designing and for sustainability and you're, you know, you're designing in a way that from a technical standpoint, you're trying to do as, as much as possible to reach your net zero, or you're in the transit space and you know you're delivering on a public good uh, because, you know, we, it's a big gap in how much transit or if it's in healthcare and so forth. But it's always important to ask the question, can every dollar, can every ounce of energy that I'm exerting, can it do more and do more meaning, can it benefit more than just who I think it's benefiting right now? Right. And so, you know, let's use transit as an example. There is billions of dollars going into transit because transit costs a lot of money. Infrastructure is a, is a multi-decade investment and it's disruptive. But it, but are we able to answer the question, you know, yes, it's disruptive and the beneficiaries will be, and that K graph that I showed, this is a mechanism to enable us to bridge that better because it will create more access for more. And can I prove that? 
and and it's not giving more access only to those who are uh, you know they they can do with the access but they're financially they're they're not necessarily in a they're we're creating convenience but versus access and i there's a distinction between that mm -hmm. yes that's really important I think, yeah, so far we've sort of addressed maybe the bottom up sort of model. Like we're talking about consultation, we're talking about bringing in voices from communities to be at the table and discuss. What are some top down approaches? Well, I think if uh, there's, I think as a, anyone in a leadership position um, uh, has the ability to, to strengthen, mentor, and sponsor. Um, uh, emerging talent, uh, young talent within the organization. Um, there's an interesting, I mean, I spend a lot of time now with rising leaders and I, I will say that, you know, I, I'm, um, I've been educated post-secondary. I have a degree of privilege in that just by virtue of that, my network begins with those folks who equally are educated like myself. There are many um, very talented, incredibly uh, capable uh, young leaders in in the greater Toronto Hamilton area who wouldn't even know how to or where to or how to have a conversation with someone in a C-suite or, or an executive or someone in a leadership role. And by even individually, uh, when you're in a leadership person uh, uh, in that kind of role, you have the opportunity to share your views and to hear the views of others. And and the reason why this is critical, and, and I know there was a long question in there about density, and I will get to that, but I, I think the question of anything to do with our physical environment, understanding the implications, the impacts from others, other than those that we know, is actually a really important uh, element of um, expanding our ability to solution. And so very simple things like, we have a at civic action we have this program called civic match we enable young rising leaders to connect with c-suite and literally that connection is a sharing of perspectives and that is a it begins to actually cultivate everyone's both on the c-suite side and on the rising leaders side uh, a deeper appreciation of of the things that keep us apart and and th th those are bridges worth building and so 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 leaders can do that leaders can also within their organization if you're hiring and you've got recruitment uh inherently uh, there is bias built into how we write a job description there are ways to remove barriers for those we have a program we work with employers about how to screen out job descriptions and titles. And, you know, we generally overextend uh, the kind of qualifications we need. Uh, we, we magnify the type of qualifications we need for a job. We don't value li lived experience. Mm -hmm. And um, those are things that actually can enrich uh, all of us from, uh, from actually building a workforce that is be better, more sensitive to, and capable of uh, identifying where we're being exclusive in, in our practices, not just exclusive as in not including specific communities, but in our internal practices as well. So I think th those are uh, some of the areas. I think the other area I would talk about is really in um, how we, what, what we deem as uh, performance measures and our success, success measures. And so I think many organizations are now focused on uh, ESGs. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the KPIs that deliver on outcomes that are more sustainable. But I think um, we are yet to really um, uh, calibrate a system that can quantify um, the qualitative societal benefits that many of our projects and um, initiatives uh, deliver. So I think that's an area that um, organizations and management and leadership really need to pay attention to because otherwise um, we're using these as a checkbox uh, where we are, and, and people are using it as a risk mitigation factor um, mm -hmm. as opposed to an actual um, impact measure. Um, that being said, there are some really, some for some organizations I know DREAM has their impact um, investment and folks like Taz are doing some good work in this area, but they're in the minority and, and, and we need to see the industry move uh, better in this direction. That's an excellent answer, thank you. I'm going to get to a couple of questions we have now in the chat as well. I believe you can see them too, right, Leslie? 
Yes, I can see them. Yeah. Them for the audience, but just so you can <laughs> have a look. Um, so I have someone's asking about density, and essentially, that I'll just read the question aloud. Is there a template that asks community what is comfortable with what what it is comfortable with when it comes to density? What is seeking? What it is seeking in community benefits? What it is concerned with when it regards to development? So okay. Guess, how can yeah. You, uh, yeah. And it's, it's a, a yeah. And it's a timely question because I, you know, I know that the provincial housing uh, task force just released its <clears throat> report on 55 recommendations around um, uh, the need for more housing and uh, the fact that in order to accomplish this uh, huge um, deficit in supply, we're going to have to address the issue of density. So. So I'm not anti-density, um, uh, I am pro-density. Uh, the thing that I think I would say to this question about is there a template uh, for deriving community benefits, I think there are some fundamental questions that everyone needs to ask themselves as we think about density in terms of not so much the physical structure or the height limit or the shape of the building or the, how it hits the ground plane, but what is it composed of? So if it's only, um, you know, high, high, in so even if we expanded the supply, how are we gonna ensure that is actually affordable? Cause I'm not even, I'm not convinced that even if we do address the supply that that will guarantee affordability. It will guarantee availability, mm -hmm. uh, but that does not guarantee affordability. And so there's a whole other mechanism uh, and, and, and things that we need to pay attention to whether, I mean, there's a call for um, the importance of rental, purpose built rental, the mix of uses, but there's a broader thing to this point of template, which I think we can look to the folks, you know, the healthy communities folks, the folks who are focused on complete communities, what is sustainable, the eight to 80 movement, all those things talk about what are the factors that uh, contribute to a, a healthy environment that, that uh, individuals can, can thrive in. And so I think that if I was to talk about a template that derives community benefits, it's have we figured out not just the physical location and allocation of space for a public health system or a daycare system, but have we actually thought through and have we worked with and are there players at the table understanding how we will operationalize this? How uh, will it work on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, have we thought through access to public space, access to semi-public space, private space, um, uh, open space, nature? I think this, it's, it's city building at its completeness. Mm -hmm. And so when we ask ourselves, what are, who, what are the community benefits? What's the formula? I think um, in the US, there's uh, specific formulas that have, have been put out relative to proportion of income and, and the size of the square footage of the place. I think every community organization and municipality uh, really needs to test uh, some of those things uh, based on uh, the expertise of folks like the TCHC and their experience or wood green uh, community housing to understand what's viable, while at the same time recognizing that the development industry is, you know, they're, 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 they have to make money. It's not, it's not like this is a freebie, that it's a, char a, a completely charitable exercise. And that's the bridge that needs to be built in that dialogue. And we have examples in Toronto in particular of where that public-private partnership and, and working with the not-for-profit has worked. I mean, the Daniels Group and what has, the transformation of Regents Park is a prime example. Uh, how could it have been, you know, what is being, what, what could have been improved from that? Um, I think Mitchell Cohen will say there's lots of things that could be improved, lots of communities uh, that, but, but it, it starts from a good place. So I think um, the, the question around how we address issues of density is not, is not should we have density, but how are we making sure that we're calibrating to the relative number and of people and the range and diversity of incomes and education levels and types of, of housing arrangements that they're complemented, but all the things that make a, a complete our ability to kind of live a more complete life and, um, and, and, and access to the kind of prosperity we need. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think that kind of like reiterates a point you made before. Like we know that density is beneficial in a lot of ways. I feel like at least most of the audience realize that like for our cities, density is beneficial, but it's also about 
how can we have more people benefit from this too? Can I, Nigel, at the end of that question, there was a question around, there was a comment around how do we, um, uh, you know, uh, how do we make sure that we create a win-win rather than the current confrontational approach? I don't know that, um, yeah, I think there will, so there will be difference of opinion, I think, and there will be conflicting views, especially when change is happening, you know, it, it, we're disruptive, you know, whether it's making way for public spaces and having to take away privately owned lands or how to, to, to recalibrate to publicly owned spaces, that, that is part of the change. I think what it, we need to have is more respect and understanding of each other in that act. And that you know, there, is, there, is, there is, as much as uh, you know, it is disruptive um, and we can appreciate it. And I think we need to be empathetic to the, the, the change that individuals have to go through in that change, whether if your house is being expropriated for a transit line or if uh, for more park space or any of those things. But it, it, we, we have sort of lost empathy for each other in some degree uh, that and, and uh, an acknowledgement that, um, that, yeah, that, that we run the risk of the tragedy of the commons the more and more we sort of separate our, our individual needs and, and not appreciate the kind of broader collective needs. But I think that is an interesting question too. Maybe you want to go back to it. The question is, what are the main points in the K-graph that we should be considering in everything we do? Yeah, the K-graph is a, I, use, I would say, use it as a heuristic. It's symbolic of the fact that inevitably, not inevitably, um, the, the pandemic, sorry, let me answer this better. Use it as a heuristic for the questions you, we all need to ask ourselves when we are making our decisions around the projects that we're involved with or the investments we're involved with. Because we want to ask the questions, is the decision I'm making around uh, by supporting uh, a, a choice of a sp specific technology or by uh, d determining that um, a certain software service is what I need to ask us, well, when I choose that industry or I choose that form of technology, um, can I even ask them that organization the question, how are you address, what is your value system? How are you, because amongst the range of folks in these different industries, they can do, a, they can do their part and you want to associate and, and align your values with those of other organizations. The, at the bottom side of that chart, which are those industries and by virtue of that, those communities and individuals and, and parts of our society that are not doing as well economically. You want to ask yourselves in what I'm doing, is there a way to draw in, uh, you know, art, local artists or um, folks from the hospitality industry in what we're um, doing? Are there skills that I could benefit and bring to the table in what I'm doing? And so it, it, it is really a heuristic and in your thinking about it, and if you're visually always thinking that there is a gap, that part of what I'm trying to do is bridge that gap, uh, you, it just, it, it remains with you in terms of how you're thinking about um, your own work. And that's how I use it. I mean, you can look at it technically, you can kind of analyze it in terms of the specific in industries, but I think I use it as a little gauge to say every day, I want to be part of making that gap smaller and smaller in whatever I do. That's wonderful. And I think it's also important to know too, that these industries that we're working to include in this way, it's not charity, like they have so much to offer and they have as much to offer as those industries that are already being included. They're just kind of not in the framework right now. But it's, it's beneficial for all of us to have those people and those industries there at the table too. Nigel, there's some questions in the chat. So mm -hmm. Some people put them in the chat and some of them put in the questions. Okay, actually, this is a great question. Um, when engaging groups for official plan review, how can we present the plan so we can link it to lived experience? How do we gather their feedback from underrepresented groups on the plan? I think first thing to do is recognize the limitations of an official plan. And so if you're putting all your eggs in that basket, um, I would suggest that you'll, it, it's, it's limited by what the official plan can do. It can do some things, but it's, it's, you know, in that diagram of, you know, what the system includes, it's one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So I think 
yes, we can engage different folks. Yes, we can um, put language in there that reflects issues that may or may not in the past have been addressed in an official plan. But in the end, the real, the, the, what is it? The rubber hits the road, the proof is in the pudding, is actually in the translation of that official plan on the ground and into the projects. And so um, I, I think that the official plan always follows it does it has it's very difficult um, for it to lead the process of developing an official plan can be um, revealing and it can actually be a stepping stone for other things other uh, outputs and outcomes other than the plan itself and so i think um, we need to think about it in that way that the official plan is a mechanism for consulting but it is it it's it, it's output that plan is just one of many so one of many things that can come out of that so whether or not in engaging in an official plan process you can bring in different voices then it's not only a question of what those voices can do in the official plan how can we then leverage those voices bring them in into other pieces of the puzzle so they bring different talents different expertise um, they come from different sectors and trying to really understand how you can leverage that from a you know from a from that expertise into you know we need to figure out how the, you know the issue how public health plays a role into designing a, a, a new community or a, within a, a block of a development um, what are the voices that uh, can, or how can we nurture those voices to be accomplices in the system, system, systemic change that is needed, and how can we support them in that view? And so, I think you, we play a role, a technical role, um, uh, in the definition of the plan. We play a role in the convening of different voices. We play a role in an, a, being an accomplice for those different inter interests to help change be part of the systemic change in how we support. So I think it, it's, I, so I think it's a good question, but I, 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 I encourage those on this call to think beyond uh, the capability of, of you know, such a, a, a smart group like this group who's gathered here, that, um, that there's more that you can do beyond the, the tools that we have been presented alone in this industry. And I encourage people to engage in that way. Wonderful. Okay, so for the next question, I feel like this is a good question because I feel like what you're saying here is a bit of a call to action. Like you're asking for people to take some initiative and like implement some practical changes, which I think is great. And I think we all need to learn those things. So this question is, what are some action items we can implement in the development process that would reduce the difference in the K graph? What are some action items? So I would say, um, There are a number of um, organizations, there are a number of initiatives that uh, would benefit from the expertise around this table um, because they are addressing some of the systemic changes that, you know, if you think about the whole ecosystem of getting buildings done and creating cities are not necessary to the orb that a planner or an architect or a developer sits in, but we get it, they're the things we rub up against um in in trying to do good work and so i would say lend your support and what what that support can manifest it, itself in many different ways it could be in your experience your expertise uh your voice how you showcase the work of others who are in this space be an accomplice because while your center of gravity is in the work you do there are others that you can use your privilege your advantage uh, to support that in the end is a win-win for both you and for those organizations. So whether it is in healthcare, in childcare, in, you know, f you know, it's civic action, it's in leadership. And in, there are many places, uh, you know, someone raised the issue of the environment, it, you know, environmental groups. Well, while they are um, not, not only not-for-profits, but assisting um, government agencies and those that are trying to push forward public policies that you think are are instrumental to change uh, systemic systemic views i think there's there's a role for this sector this group this the folks who normally come to smart density discussions to not only center on the issues that you have been but to look around and because i think what you're experiencing and some of the challenges and probably frustrations you're facing 
are because there are some inherent systemic structures that don't allow us to really truly expand our ability to have more sustainable communities communities don't really enable us to address issues of access and, and affordability that are outside the realm of if you're designing a building. And so recognize that, understand you're in this bigger ecosystem and leverage all that you have where you can to support those and be an accomplice and a co-conspirator to that change. I don't know how concrete that was, but it's, it is a call to action to kind of look around. Everybody will individually choose, Nigel, the thing that they feel most um, uh, akin to Mm -hmm. um and and that they feel that um it's more specific but i think a part of what i'm saying is there's there's a lot we can do in public policy there's a lot we can do on the planning side but there's a whole other ecosystem that is 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 not in balance uh, and that's what's causing this big gap and and so we need to look outside our own professions and our own industries and and be a bridge uh, to 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 each other and and to those other spaces with our own work wherever possible, and there's people who are great models, and we should we should um, recognize them. We should celebrate them. I, I am a big fan of of the work uh, that folks like Daniels or what uh, Dream has been doing. Um, what I see Taz uh, doing. Uh, there are other, uh, you know, there are groups that are really recognizing the power they have in this business beyond just um, the work itself and the structures and the physical impacts itself. There are, there, are, there's so much more we can be doing. Totally. I, th I think this transitions well into this question too, like thinking about Daniels and thinking about tasks or dream and their sort of impact strategies. Mm -hmm. Someone is asking, how do you balance? And as you said, like development is expensive. It costs a lot to create housing or any sort of development. So how do you balance the need for profit on behalf of developers with creating equity and being inclusive? And like, perhaps like what would you say are some concrete things that these examples you've used are actually doing on the ground? So I think the difference between, um, I'm just gonna pull up the question a minute. The difference uh, be between this question of balance, I'm not sure, I'm not a big believer in balance, but anyway, um, uh, I would say it's the difference between a short view and a long view. So if you, uh, if you and the Royal you uh, have a short view of uh, what you're trying to, you know, the outcome or the output, not the outcome, the output you wanna have, you will always remain in the space. You won't be able to bridge to this conversation we're having because I, I, I truly, if it's short-term financial gain um, is all you're after. And if that's all you're after, then, then I think it's gonna be difficult. If you're in the long game, which is also about financial gain, but it's patient money, um, you are investing not only for yourself and your, your own financial gain, but you're investing in community over a longer period of time. I remember having a con conversation with um, Frank Giannone at FRAM around port credit and you know the time and investment that went into that, but it was for him an investment in community. It was more than just concrete and steel. And so not everybody wants to have that space, but frankly, if we could have more, that's where we need to be in it. And, to, and so I, it, so, I, I don't think it's a either or. I think it's choices we all make that are driven by our own value system. I mean, it, it, uh, we, 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 um, we are in this work for, we're all driven personally by something to be in this business. And, some, uh, some, and so you want to be able to ask yourself, is it, is it, is it short term only? In which case I, it's hard for me to even I mean, there's small things that you can do if you're if that's how you're thinking about it, mm -hmm. but but hopefully people are in this not when I think long term and even selfishly long term, for your kids for the next generation and 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 what you're creating for for your own family or your own community, uh, I think there that you would take make different choices, um, uh, because I think you would be wanting to and we should be wanting to uh, contribute a, a greater. Um, to a greater timeline than just tomorrow and, and, and so forth. And I know, um, you know, people, you know, I'm no, I'm not naive to the fact that um, development industry in particular, there's a wide spectrum. Uh, 
of uh, you know the success rate and how much profit people make or don't make and i recognize that and yes it's hard and everybody does need to make a, a piece but ultimately uh, my hope for this for uh, our hope of success in this space is that people are able to take a longer view mm -hmm. that's really excellent yeah there's a lot more that can be done with like longer term investment and just yeah thinking about where money is going and who's benefiting from that in the future too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's wonderful. Um, we're closing up on our time here. I'm wondering, oh, let's see. Um, any, I'm okay, wait. yeah, this one, uh, they're wondering if you have any examples or success stories where corporate boards have taken that longer view and like waited for patient money. Like, do you see that happening? Well, I would say, so a, an example of patient money, uh, pension funds tend to be more patient money, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Right, and because they have a vested, the, the, the term of the, their vested interest is longer. I mean, when we look um, at, you know, whether you agree or disagree with the design of the buildings or all those pieces, the investments that folks like Brookfield have put into sustainability and building systems, and when we look at what they've done in New York, um, I think there, uh, there's, they have, well, first of all, they have scale. So that is a big advantage, uh, scale of, of, of their, uh, um, this, you know, the size of their pockets. Um, but they're also, uh, they are holding, they have investments with a, lo with a longer term in mind. And therefore they're able to actually invest in, you know, operating systems of a building that are more beneficial on a very practical note uh, for that. So, so I think pension funds and uh, are one uh, where, where they invest. Mm -hmm. I think um, there are, there are developers, you know, I, I sat, I sat on the um, ULI jury for the urban visionaries this year and uh, Jonathan Rose was the recipient. He was the laureate this year. And he has been, I would look to him as an example, uh, his corporation as what I call patient investment. Um, he has been for decades fine tuning and investing in complete communities before any of us talked about sustainability and kept at it uh, in a way that has continues to evolve and, um, and, and at one point seems old fashioned in its desires, uh, but in fact, um, he didn't, he's persisted. He's been very successful financially, him, when I say him, him, his organization, and an example of how um, you can actually attain multiple benefits and for yourself and uh, many communities. And he's still continuing to work on it to, to improve. So it's, it's never, it's, it's, an, it's, a life's, it's a life's commitment. It's not a one and done kind of activity. More questions. Yeah. See if there's any that look good for you. I feel like, yeah, the call is closing up soon. We got to go. So if there also, if there's any just last remarks you'd like the audience to hear after this. Yeah, maybe I'll do, uh, maybe just a quickly side out so people can get out of here on time. I, I think I want to make sure that people don't feel discouraged by the scale and enormity, at least enormity of the challenge ahead to kind of bridge this gap, um, get closer to the concept of a more inclusive city region. We have the best foundation in this, in the GTHA and the Greater Golden Horseshoe to be exemplars of that. Um, we, we have, we've set ourselves well up for it, but we are really at a, a bit of a risk um, right now in this uh, space of time. And we're also at a point in time where um, we're at the risk of missing a great opportunity because of uh, the place our economy is in right now. So, so that my call to action is really around the time we're in right now and what we need to, to have at hand. The other thing I'd, I'd like to say is that one of the most inspiring and exciting and hopeful things I do, I get, I have the privilege of doing every day is talking and meeting with, um, whether it's our diversity fellows, our emerging leaders network at Civic Action, who are going to be and are, are, currently are, and will continue to be our greatest hope for changing the status quo. And so I th think wherever what 
uh, why I, I enjoy this job so much is giving them the spotlight, allowing them the room, uh, sharing our, our, our own experiences with um, rising leaders, um, and supporting them in even the, the kind of what sometimes may seem like far out their ideas or not, not really understanding how they fit in, because it is going to be the next generation and the generation after that are really, if we don't set them up for success, um, it's really going to be a missed opportunity. It could go all really, really wrong, but I, I'm very hopeful that um, those of us are with the privilege in positions of power, regardless of your industry or title, that we have a, a responsibility to amplify those voices, to champion their ideas, and um, and to continue uh, to kind of push for the change that is needed in this industry. And I, I think I would say that uh, we are behind. Uh, I spent, you know, I'm on a hospital board. I work with a lot of the banks and I, I would say the industry is lagging on this dimension. Uh, it is very progressive on so many other places, but um, we do need to push ourselves a little harder and look a little further to our left and to our right and behind us. We're very focused in front, but let's sideways and back is good too. <laughs> or like very far. <laughs> oh, very far. But I think we're good. I think you know, the planners in the room, they're very good at looking far ahead. But I think our vision, what we see ahead is very much informed by what, we're, what we know is behind us because all of us have our own blind spots. Absolutely. Yeah, I love what you said about it. It goes beyond just the hiring process, but also like letting people feel comfortable to bring up bold ideas and listening to those and not sort of alienating those, those ideas that like up and coming planners or architects have in regards to these topics. Mm -hmm. That's great. Nigel, if folks, there are a couple of questions that didn't get answered. I'm happy if uh, I can send a little email. I'll send you some um, little sort of note emails if people want a little response uh, after, if if because we didn't get to all the questions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if anyone has questions they'd like to answer that we didn't get to, feel free to email me or Leslie, and we can get back to you. Some of them are beyond me. Like I think my brain isn't large enough for some of those questions, but uh, what I can yeah. just give my opinion more than anything. I don't have all that. I don't have all the solutions. This is a whole other webinar. I don't know if we can do that right now, but I appreciate all the questions that people asked. Um, but yeah, Leslie, I'd like to thank you so much for coming today and encouraging us all to, you know, think beyond the built form and like the ways that our planning and architecture like really affects communities in the long term and what we can do to address that. My, my honor to be here and thank you all and thank you for taking time out of your um, almost it's lunchtime now you can all go everybody can go munch. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Nigel. Great, great job. Bye -bye. And you guys at Smart Density are doing awesome. So thank you for doing this. Thanks. Bye-bye.